In Ezra chapter 7, I'm going to read verses 6 through 10. The writer says, This Ezra came up from Babylon, and he was skilled, a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. On the first day of the month, he began his journey from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. Amen. I want to share with you this morning from this subject, the good hand of God. The good hand of God. God, thank you that your presence is already here. Oh God, we realize that this is maybe the most important time of a worship service. So I pray that you would quicken my heart, give me wisdom to preach. But thus saith the Lord, I decrease that you might increase. Illuminate your word to your people. Let your word find us at the point of our greatest needs. Somebody who came searching for answers today, God, I pray that they would find an answer in your word. Someone today who is desperate, maybe depressed, or in some other form of distress, I pray they would find rest today in your word. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to draw my text this morning from verses 6 and then 9 and 10 in this text that I read because there's a theme that continues to peek its head and it jumps off the page. In verse 6 it says, This Ezra came from Babylon and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Skipping down to verse 9, on the first day of the month he began his journey from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. The good hand of our God. Before I get deep into my message this morning, I want you to know that my overall objective today is above anything else, above all else, is that you might walk away from this service today knowing without a doubt that the good hand of God is upon you. If you are a born again believer who has given your life to Jesus Christ, then his hand is upon your life. And so out of everything that I say today, if you get or hear nothing else, I pray and hope that you will walk away with the divine assurance that the good hand of God rests upon you. Even when bad is around, his good hand is on you. In reading a portion of the history of Judah in the book of Daniel, we find that the children of Israel spent 70 years of exile in Babylon. They were there because of their unwillingness to follow the laws of God. And in reading this account of their exile, it's interesting to me to learn that there were some good things that actually happened while they were in a place of exile. In fact, it's during this account, their time of exile, that we read of a young boy by the name of Daniel, who, who got set apart from the rest of the Hebrew men who were in there in exile with him. It's in this context that uh, the Babylonian exile that, that we find that God closed the mouth of the lion so that Daniel's life was spared. Not sure if you knew or understood that the context of that is that they were in exile at the time. 
It was in the Babylonian time of exile that we read of three Hebrew boys, you know them by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who, who although they were living in a strange land, they were still devoted to their God. And because they refused to bow to the golden image, the Bible says they were thrown into a furnace of fire to be burned. One of the greatest lessons we learn when we read the account of Israel's Babylonian exile is just how good our God is. Even in your most difficult place, he's still good. We learn that God still blesses his people even when you're in the midst of trouble. In fact, the Bible says uh, that Daniel, as one of the exiles taken from his homeland, was literally elevated to the position of governor in a foreign land. According to scripture, there was a, the Bible says there was an excellent spirit in him. He was a faithful man and there was no fault found in him. And, and the reason is because God's hand was upon him. We know the only way he was able to avoid becoming a feast for the lions was that the hand of God was upon him. God always has a way of working things for our good, even when bad is, even when bad is present around us. We always, uh, we always find rest in God even when there's times of trouble. He showed up in the fire, the Bible says, proving that he's there even in the most difficult times of our lives. Sometimes they were, somehow these young men were able to walk boldly with their God, even in the face of an apparent death. Perhaps they had read the word of uh, the, the king of, of Judah, the former king of the nation of Judah, named David, when he says in Psalms 91, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent shall trample you underfoot. Uh, their lives represent to us today a reflection of what it looks like when the good hand of God is upon us. And that really gives us a segue into where I want to get to this morning in the text where we read of a prophet by the name of Ezra. Ezra is a man that not many people have read his book. He's one of those people that uh, when you get to his book you kind of see a, a weird name and you skip over it. But if you take time to really look and chronicle the life of Ezra, you'll find that Ezra was actually a priest and a scribe. But the interesting thing about Ezra is that he was not taken into Babylonian exile. He was literally born while they were in exile. He had grown up in bondage. He had never known what it was to be free. Yet he comes to a time in his life where the king gives him permission to return to his homeland and to begin to lead people he's never lived with. Ezra was well versed in the laws of Jehovah. He was born of the tribe of Levi. His uh, great, 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 however many times removed grandfather was, was Aaron, who was a prophet, who was a priest, I'm sorry, and who was of the tribe of Levi. And he was also a scribe, so he spent his time writing the laws. Tells me that while they were in exile, somebody must have held to their God, even though they were in a strange place. Somebody taught him the laws of scripture. They taught him what his people believed. And so he would literally take time to write the laws of God for them. Despite the fact, however, that he lived in a strange land, Babylon, his bloodline rendered him a member of the priestly order. Are you with me? Stay with me. Don't get lost here. Although he was born in a strange land, he still had the priestly order bloodline running in his veins. One note as we move further is that you and I should always know that your spiritual bloodline always takes precedence over your physical circumstances. His current circumstances didn't dictate his spiritual reality. In Revelation 1, 6, the Bible refers to us as kings and priests. He says, we're kings and priests unto God. So uh, we can live victoriously knowing that despite times of difficulty, we've got the priest's blood running through our veins. Ezra, as a priest and a scribe, finds himself in a place to be sent back home 
to his people to instruct them on the ways of the gospel. And in telling his own account of how this happened, he begins to explain how he was shown favor by the king and how he was allowed to return to his own people. And as I read this, it struck me that he used these words often when he would talk about the hand of God. He explains it in verse 6 by saying the king granted him all his requests because the hand of the Lord was upon him. In verse 9, he describes it by saying the good hand of God is upon me. In fact, if you didn't know this, he literally refers to the hand of God six times between chapters 7 and 8. And I don't know about you, but I've learned that whenever God says something to us over and over again in Scripture, it's because he wants us to play, pay close attention. Ezra uses this phrase to make the distinction that his ability to be released from exile and, and go and lead his people back into the ways of Scripture had nothing to do with a good-hearted king. It had nothing to do with people who were on his side. But he makes this distinction to say it was nothing but the power of God and the good hand of God that was upon my life. I believe Ezra used this phrase so many times because he wanted the reader, he wanted us right. to be assured that the good hand of God can bring you through anything. Amen. That no matter where you find yourself, the hand of God that's upon you can lead you and guide you through any circumstances today. And I believe God wants us to be reminded today of two things. First, he wants you to be reminded that his hand is upon you. While the enemy may tell you that God has forgotten you and that God is not thinking about you, God brought you here today to remind you that his good hand is still upon you even though you don't feel him. The second thing I believe he wants to remind us of today is that when his hand is upon you, there's no circumstance that is so destitute and so bad that God can't bless you right in the middle of it. Amen. Amen. I thought I would get some amen on that. I want to talk us through this passage here today and talk about the good hand of God. Now, what does it mean to say the hand of God? Many oftentimes we hear people say that. We know that God is a spirit. He doesn't literally have hands. That caught some of y'all off guard. <laughs> We're the ones living in human flesh. God is a spirit. He doesn't literally have actual hands with fingers and all these things. When scripture talks about the hand of God, it's using symbolism, but it's called, it's using that word to symbolize the favor of God, the protection of God. The strength of God, the guidance of God. When his hand is upon you, it's the characteristics that he uses to lead you and to give you victory in your life. Amen. Amen. When God's hand is upon you, you walk in a special place of grace. Amen. A special place of protection. Where the enemy just can't overtake you no matter how hard he tries. Amen. You know the story of Job, how the enemy tried to overtake him? But God reminds us in the beginning that it was his doing that allowed to happen in Job's life would happen because his hand was there all the time. I want to share with you a few things. I'm moving fast because I took up most of my time in the beginning. But I want to share with you a few things that the hand of God represents in our lives. If you're taking notes, here's a place to take notes. First of all, the hand of God demonstrates his sovereignty in our lives. His sovereignty. In case you did not know this, the hand of God is always perpetually moving and orchestrating details in your life, even when you are not mindful of it. Whether it's an evil boss or just a person who's a thorn in your flesh, don't look at the person next to you. No matter what it is, God is always sovereignly working on your behalf. The sovereignty of God is that characteristic of God that we can't touch. It's that thing that we can't explain because it's beyond the ability of human uh, mindset to uh, understand and comprehend. It's God being God and doing what he chooses. But always promising that it's for our good. Proverbs 21 1 says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and like rivers of water he turns it wherever he wishes. The king in that passage does not necessarily represent the actual king but anybody who has control or influence in your life at the time. At any moment it might be your boss. 
it might be somebody, a friend, it might be somebody else, but at the time, God's sovereign order will orchestrate circumstances in your life so that they turn out in your favor. And that's what the hand of God is in our lives. It's God's sovereign will and sovereign plan manipulating the, the parts, portions of our life for us to end up in his will. Good example in scripture is, is the story of Joseph. This is a divine reflection of sovereignty. Sovereignty is oftentimes mixed with pain. But the pain doesn't negate the presence of God. Joseph was in a place where he was on a journey. And in each juncture of his journey, God orchestrated things sovereignly so that Joseph would be taken care of. While he was in the pit, the good hand of God was upon him. Because he orchestrated it that some Israelites would come that way and would pull him out of the pit to take him to Egypt where God ultimately needed him to be. When he was in Egypt, the good hand of God was upon him. Because the Bible says that while he was in Egypt, there was this woman who accused him falsely of raping her. The pain doesn't negate the presence. He was thrown into prison for being falsely accused, but the good hand of God was upon him. When he got into prison, there was a baker and a butler who were there, who had dreams that they needed interpreting, and the good hand of God was upon him, and he interpreted the dreams. The Bible says that when the baker and the butler got out of prison, they told the king, they said, there's this man that can interpret your dreams. The king said, bring him. He stood in front of the king, and when he stood in front of the king, the good hand of God was upon him. He gives the king the interpretation of his dream and tells the king how to rule his kingdom and how to live through a drought. The drought comes, but the good hand of God is upon Joseph. To take it one step further, Pastor Joe, not only was the good hand of God upon Joseph, but because of God's hand upon Joseph, his good hand was also upon Egypt. Now, I know that this will mess with some of y'all's theology, but sometimes God will bless your enemies because of his favor upon you. <laughs> Pastor, you preaching now. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. And sometimes the giftings and the blessings of God don't discriminate. <laughs> That means that when God rains on you, whoever happens to be close to you at the time might get a little bit of the drenching as well. Amen. And I know it's hard for us sometimes because we say, well, I want my friends to be blessed. I don't want my enemies to be blessed. But the reality is, is that scripture Egypt was blessed because the hand of God was upon Joseph. And sometimes we have to understand that, that it is good to be in a place where we're close to the hand of God. Because when you're close to the hand of God, it will bless you, but not only you, it will bless everybody around you. I'm not really sure who I'm speaking to right here. This ain't in my notes, but I want to tell somebody this morning who, you got people around you or people of influence, and you feel powerless. You feel as though there's nothing that you can do. Maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's in your job. Maybe it's someone in your church. But I want to tell you this morning that because the good hand of God is upon you, they can't help but to come into line. They can't help but to straighten up because of the favor and the good hand of God that rests upon you this morning. He gets out and he predicts it and then uh, he, he interprets the dream and then the Bible says that he was elevated. This is the picture of sovereignty. There is often pain in God orchestrating our lives. But don't ever let the enemy make you believe that pain negates presence. Amen. Your pain does not neutralize the presence and the hand of God. The first lie the enemy tells us when we go through trouble is that God has left us. Where is God? And we somehow come to a place where we begin to believe that our pain is a determination of God's presence. But I came to tell you this morning that the same God that walked in the fiery furnace with the three Hebrew boys is walking with you through every fire that you go through. Your pain does not negate his presence. Moving on quickly, the second point I want to give you this morning is that the hand of God demonstrates his favor 
upon our lives. Let me go back and read verse 9 here. Verse 9 says, On the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his father upon him. It was God who favored Ezra to travel from Babylon to Jerusalem by his good hand upon him. I, I want to share with you two aspects of how I believe the favor of God manifests in our lives because sometimes we, one of these we skip over. First of all, he gives us favor in the sight of man. God will give you favor in the sight of man. If, 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 if your name is being uh, marginalized and, and you're being lied on and, and all kinds of things are happening, don't worry, the favor of God will elevate you and he will rectify and reconcile you in the sight of man. God gave a a Ezra favor in the sight of King Artaxerxes. Such that the king not only uh, issued a decree to release Ezra, but he told the people who were close to Ezra. Go back and read it. I didn't have time to read it all. In the decree, he says, Ezra, not only do I release you to go, but all of the Israels and priests who are in your inner circle can go with you. He gives them favor in the sight of man. It reminds me of what happened when the children of Israel were released from Egyptian bondage. The Bible says that they went to all the Egyptian people. And the Egyptian people gave them all their valuables, their gold and their silver, and said, uh, I imagine they would have been saying, this is the book of James, is our junior, but I imagine they might have been saying, I, I, I don't know what's going on here. You've been here for a long time as a slave, but all of a sudden I've got a decree from the king to let you go. You've been a slave all these years. Matter of fact, James, I just saw him beating you the other day because you didn't make the bricks quick enough because you didn't have straw. But all of a sudden I see this decree where uh, the, the king is saying to release you, and he wants me to give you my money to send you on your way. He wants you to give you the keys to my car. That's it. That's it. To let you drive out of this barren land. That's what happened. He wants me to give you the account number to my bank. Oh, that, that's what some of us right there. Let me tell you something. That's what happens when God's favorable hand is on you. Yes. When his favorable hand is on you, it unlocks all kind of blessing and all kind of things that you couldn't unlock on your own. They came in as slaves. They left as people with all kind of valuables. They were born into a wilderness, but God sent them forth, reminding them that don't ever think that because you're in a place of exile that I am not with you. Not only will I answer you, but I'll send you out better than you were when you came. You came in as slaves and people who were under the thumb of an evil ruler, but I'm going to send you out with those people's clothes on and with those people's jewelry and old people's valuables and their bank accounts and you can take as much as you want. That's the kind of God he is. And while you may be in your wilderness place, he will send you out of that place better than when you came. Some of us come out with some stuff. We come out with some good stuff. We come out having learned some things. We come out having, having grown in some ways. But I'll tell you the one that I think we all come out with that's more important than most. We all come out with a testimony. We come out being able to testify of the goodness of Jesus. You know when I was in Egypt, they made this decree that we couldn't use no more straw. They thought that was going to be the end of us. And they came down hard of us, but somehow God would bless and mold all those bricks and hold them together, even without the straw. God will always keep his people. Some of us have to remember that while you're in the land of affliction, you'll always come out with a testimony. But the second aspect of this faith that I want to offer you here, I want to highlight this because I think we overlook it. And I want you to hear this closely. Is that favor not only releases God's blessing in your life, but it actually finds you in your desolate place. Thank you, Jesus. Here's, here's how I say it. You can tweet this if you want. <laughs> uh, it's the original. The favor of God not only esteems you in the sight of men, but it also finds you in your place of obscurity. When you're in your place of obscurity, the favor of God will find you and notice you and recognize you when nobody else does. The place where nobody else knows that you're there. Have you ever gotten up one morning and you just got up in a bad place? 
Uh, come on here. I know y'all say it, but come on. You, you, you've been there. You, you walk into work and nothing's working out. You go in the door having to put out fires and deal with things and, and it just seems like nothing is going right and, 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 and you're in a place that you're mature enough now where you don't let it show on your face. If I did. You don't let it show on your face that, that, that hell is breaking out around you and inside of you, but you just smile and say, good morning, it's good to see you today. Uh, 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 thank God it was Wednesday, we're almost at Friday, but inside nobody knows what you're going through. The favor of God finds that place that nobody on the outside can see you from there. It's the desolate place. It's the desperate place. It's the place of pain. It's the place of torment. It's the place where it's dry and there's no water. It's the place where nobody understands what you're going through except favor itself. It will come and knock on your door and say, I thought, I know you thought you could hide from me, but nobody can hide from me. Favor is here to rescue you. Yeah. Reminds me of the story of David where God sent Samuel to go and tap Israel's next king. And the Bible says that he went to the house of Jesse. And while he was at the house of Jesse, Samuel was the holder of favor. Because God had placed in his, his hands the ability to anoint the next king. Samuel was searching. Come on, you're going to get this in a minute how favor finds you. Samuel was searching. God said, go to the house of Jesse. And there's one day that I'm going to show you that I'm going to know it. He was searching. The oldest went before him. That don't seem like it's the right one. And all the sons of Jesse went before him. None of them seemed like they were the right ones. And I imagine even from reading the scripture, if I could ex exegete this the proper way, that even Jesse may have in his own mind been saying, I don't know what else to offer you. Favor searching. Aren't you glad that favor don't stop searching when everybody else give up? Jesse said, oh yeah. Let me put it in the context of, the, of today's message. The oh yeah had. That oh yeah moment. That wasn't him remembering. That was the sovereign hand of God putting that seed in his mind to say this has been my plan all along. There is one. He's a shepherd boy. He's on the back side of the mountain keeping sheep. Samuel said go get him. I'm not going to leave until I see him. Favor was still searching. David came into the house smelling like stench. He was the youngest of his brethren. He was the least esteemed of his brethren. He was the one that they would look down upon and didn't get along well with, but somehow favor had the ability to weave its way sovereignly through all of these brothers and say there's somebody somewhere on the backside of a mountain in obscurity that needs me to find them. brought David before him. You see what the rest of them didn't know is that God was qualifying David while he was in obscurity. Favor was just that thing that stamped what God had already said. Because when it came time for him to fight back in battle and to be elevated into the eyes of man, you remember when the Philistine giant? When that time came, it was time for him to be elevated. The Bible says he's, he thinks back and says, oh, sovereignty. There was a lion that came to try to kill the sheep. And I don't know, somewhere, somehow, I'm a little, little kid. I, 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 I'm not anybody special. God gave me this special ability to kill this lion. And there was a bear that came to try to kill the sheep and somehow God gave me this special ability to, to kill this bear. It was, it was sovereignty working while he was in the desert place and it just needed God's sovereignty to meet with God's favor. And so that when the favor came, he was in a place where he could be elevated to where God wanted him to be. He gets in front of his brothers and Jesse 
And I know that we know from scripture that in Samuel's heart he had a check in his spirit. But somehow I got to believe that Jesse as well as a father had to look and say, oh my God, how did I not realize that God's good hand was upon this boy? How did I bring all of these brothers in front of him to, to let him look at them and not realize that it's the one that's on the backside in obscurity? Let me tell you something, saints. Sometimes you'll be in a place where nobody else knows where you are. You'll be in a hard place, a difficult place, a place where nobody can understand except you and God. But favor knows how to find you where you are and bring you from the backside of the mountain out of the obscurity and place you in the light of what God's glory is. Amen. Finally, being true to my word, I'm, trying, I'm hearing. I could, I could preach there for a long time, but I won't. It will get mad at you, brother, you keep saying that. The final. The final thing I want to offer you that represents God's hand is that the hand of God represents the protection of God upon our lives. Listen, this king could have easily not been so kind to Ezra. But in this instance, God calls Judah's enemy to show them grace. He protected them from danger. When the hand of God is upon you, he protects you from your enemies. I talked to the, the examples this morning of two men that are in the house this morning that because the good hand of God was upon them, they were protected from danger. I've already mentioned the story of the three Hebrew boys that were thrown into prison. The reality is this, saints, and it's a hard reality. The reality is this, that sometimes you're going to be thrust into some situations that you don't want to be in. There's going to be some times you're going to be thrust into fire in times of trouble that's beyond your control that you just rather not be in. But when the hand of God is upon you, he will protect you even in the fire. He never promised you wouldn't face trouble. He just promised he would walk with you while you're in trouble. Psalms 27, 5, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And my head shall be lifted above my enemies and all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy. In his tabernacle, I will sing. Yes, he says, I will sing praises to the Lord because he sets me high above all of my enemies and he protects me. When the hand of God is upon you, he will See, that's what I believe that Isaiah was talking about in Isaiah 59, where he says, when this enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against me. Come here, I got some people who are going to help me this morning. Come real quick. I want you to help me to demonstrate this. Isaiah tells Judah, he says, when the, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against me. That word standard in that scripture, stay where you at, that word standard in that scripture literally represents a wall. That's what a standard was. It's a wall, it's a buffer, it's a place of protection. Now the thing about this wall is that you can't see it. It's an invisible wall that's buffering you and trouble. Yes. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard. When trouble tries to get at me, there's a wall buffering me between me and trouble. There's trouble there, but the wall is buffering me. Now let me tell you something. Lighten up a little bit because it's going to take you out to do this for a few moments. Keep trying to get there. Just do it like, just do it like. Let me tell you something about how God wants trouble to work in our life. Trouble should not be something that takes your joy. You see, just, just, just turn around as I go. Trouble shouldn't take your joy. But when that standard is there, guess what I can do when trouble's around? I can rest in trouble. 
Come on to me. She's still trying to get me. All oh, you who are weary and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. <laughs> Take my yoke and learn of me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Not only can I rest when trouble is trying to get me, I can sleep when trouble is trying to get me. Oh, Psalm 4, it says, I will both lay down in peace and sleep. For thou alone, O Lord, makes me dwell in safety. You can see what's happening, but time is behind the scenes. In the spirit realm, but God has put a wall there buffering you from trouble. When his hand is upon you, you can rest and you can take peace in him. God didn't want you laboring and wrestling. You're wrestling as hard as trouble is. And you're trying to grab the trouble. But God says, when trouble comes, I put a standard that's strong enough to hold trouble in this place. And when I hold trouble, you can just rest. And I love the fact that he says that when I rest, I can also praise and glory. I gotta preach right there for just a moment. Sometimes you only praise God when trouble has taken and gone back home. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's no trouble. Thank you, Jesus. But what about when trouble comes back to knock on your door? I will submit to you this morning. The time to praise God is not when trouble.
prophet Isaiah. The next time, he says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. You should see a buffer between you and trouble. I know it looks bleak, but you can sleep when there's a standard buffering you. I don't know where you are today, but I've been in some places where it's been hard for me to sleep because trouble was surrounding me. But when I have a visual that the standard, God's protection, is always with me, I can rest at all times. What am I saying as I'm closing? I'm simply saying to somebody, God wants you to go home and sleep tonight. Amen. 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 Stop worrying about Amen. all that trouble that's facing you and how you're going to pay for this. Amen. How you're going to take care of that. Wow. How you're going to fix this. There's a standard that's buffering you. God wants you to go home, lay down in your bed, and Amen. sleep like a baby. Yeah. And you shouldn't have to take your bitter drill or life will because the standard will give you rest. God wants somebody to rest. Amen. Amen. One thing about trouble, the trouble won't go home sometimes, but it won't stay home long. That's right. It will always come back around. But God has promised you there's a standard that protects you. Stand to your feet.